Okay, I admit to some form of insanity. I couldn't just sit here and look at this taking apart power supply without some attempt to bring it back to life. I still don't know what was wrong with it. Here's the main board. I've got it wired to a power switch over here and an AC inlet. It's turned on right now. Let's turn it off. I replaced the 122 40 volt jumper with a piece of wire because I'm never going to run this thing at 240 volts. I'm running it with the uh, I re removed the wires that control the uh, the I removed the wires that that disable the uh, um, soft start circuit that ca caused the triac to go on. <clears throat> so anyway, it's running in soft start mode now, which is great because I can measure the input current across this resistor. The other thing I discovered was that the fuse is in the neutral side. And by doing that, uh, this thing becomes a little bit less of a death trap. This power supply is hot, connected to the one side of the line, and so is this power supply, the H-bridge. The reason they bring this to, to, the, uh, to the common of the, uh, of the uh, power supply is simply to, uh, for shielding, shielding purposes. And I guess it's better to run this at this heat sink at, uh, you know, they had a choice, right? Run it at minus 160 plus 160 or the neutral. So anyway, um, but I had the neutral and hot reversed going into the board, figuring that, you know, in general, you like the, uh, the hot wire to be in series with the fuse. But uh, that's not how this is built. So by wiring, by wiring it the way it was originally intended, the fuse is in the neutral, which is fine. My little test thing over here has another fuse. The main, the main fuse is 20 amps, and the fuses in this unit are in both the line and the neutral, and they're only 2 amps. So for now, I'm going to run this thing at lower power. I certainly don't want it to dissipate 800 watts ever, um, but especially when I'm powering it up for the first time. So yeah, so I powered it up, get the plus or minus 160 out. So then how about the control circuitry? I had sort of brutally removed the transformer, the transformer primary wires, and a whole lot of, uh, and a whole lot of circuitry, and a whole lot, I removed a whole lot of the control wires. Fortunately, I kept this little harness. This was the um, six pin control connector. It has the remote sense wires, which these went back to the card cage in the original unit. And these two connectors, one of them's ground and the other one is enable and you just ground ground this to turn the power supply on. And thank goodness I kept this because this tells me what some of these colored wires do. I know what I know what the pins do on this. Uh, there's one pin I don't I don't know, but the four pins that are important are the uh, are the two remote the two remote sense wires and the uh, enable in the ground. So then the question is which of these wires is the regular sense wires and I haven't I haven't done that yet typically the way remote sense works is you use the normal sense wires to the power supply but they can be overridden by the remote sense and usually there's some hundred ohm resistors or a couple of hundred ohm resistors between the remote sense wires and the regular wires so that if you hook up the remote sense wires uh, they they drive the inputs anyway so I can figure out where the where the real sense wires are. I suspect it's these, this red and yellow wire here, but I'm not sure. But for now I can just use a remote sense uh, once I hook up the output section. So this was powered originally by by this transformer. And this is a kind of an interesting transformer. I'm not, originally I thought this was a high current secondary and this was the primary, but no, no, no. This is the primary and a three wire primary. Why do they have three wires? Well it turns out it can either take 240 or 110 so I think the input jumpers I lost the other side of this cable harness. I think I disconnected it or I unsoldered it. Anyway, so half of this transformer runs off 110 and 
the other half the, and the other half runs off another 110 so two or two, 120 so 240 total so anyway I could just hook this up to 110 and then hook this up to the to the board and it connects to the board right here these inputs are from the uh, from the small transformer that just powers up the electronics and there's the diode bridge for them you can see the diodes and the filter capacitor is here and I measured the I measured I haven't I haven't powered up this transformer yet but I measured the inductance of the primary and the secondary and I figured out what the turns ratio was and figured out that it puts out about 20 volts AC so for now I'm just driving this with I don't think it I don't think I need the 60 Hertz anywhere in this system if it needs 60 Hertz then I'm gonna have to hook up a real transformer and I probably will eventually but for now I'm just driving it with uh, 20 volts DC which is a little lower than the usual voltage and this red clip here this oh I added a ground test point there was no, there was no ground test point on the board so I found the ground and I, and I wired up a ground test point here and I'm using that to enable the output. I don't know what the actual voltage is. I'll probably hook up this transformer just to get an idea what it see if my calculations are really correct. This is a 35 volt capacitor here so that also is a hint that the input supply voltage is around 24 volts. As I said I don't know exactly what it is. Printed out the data sheet for the controller IC. It's an interesting story. It turns out this chip is a SG3527. Now what's a 3527? Well it's the same as a 3525 except the outputs are inverted. So instead of the pulsing, pulsing outputs going high, which they do on this chip, on the 27 they pulse low. That's the only difference. Is that they probably these, these two inputs are swapped. And the bad news about the 27 is that it's no longer available. You can get all the 25s you want. It's made by On Semi, SG, uh, ST, and a couple of other companies. It's a very, it's the, probably one of the most popular high power uh, switching power supply controllers in the world. But the 27 <laughs> is on Obtanium. You can't get them at DigiKey. You know, if you want, if you want to buy old stock, you can. I can, I can probably find one somewhere. But thank goodness this one's working, so that shouldn't be a problem. So anyway, um, th I printed this out just so I could have the pinouts. So I checked the input. The input is 20 volts. The reference voltage is 5.1 volts, as it should be. And the um, oscillator and the comp is uh, oscillating nicely at uh, about 26 kilohertz. And the outputs are outputting uh, a full, full output um, pulses. So uh, high, you know, roughly not not quite 50% because they have some dead time so about 45% duty cycle on these two outputs so so this chip is working so I did that before I powered up the AC side uh, and once I was once I was confident that the control circuit was basically working oh and I checked that all the way to the gate drive transformers and it looks like looks like that's all working too so once I was confident that this chip was working and the gate drive circuit which is over here is wor is working that's these two power transistors and these big power so I so but as I'm running it I noticed that the uh, that my power supply I'll show you here so I'm running it off this uh, this old lambda power supply so it's set for, let's see, yeah, about 20 volts. The circuit's drawing about 0.1 amps. And I thought that was reasonable. But when I first powered it up, it was drawing point, close to 0.3 amps. And I thought, mm, that's kind of a lot of power. Where's that, uh, where's that six watts going? <laughs> and uh, it's got to be going somewhere. And... Uh, after about 15 or 20 minutes, I noticed the uh, smell of heating electronics, and it turns out these two, these two beefy 150 ohm power resistors, uh, were getting extremely hot. And I think what was happening was the uh, when the power supply is disabled, and I haven't haven't quite figured this out yet. There may be some other magic going on here, but when the power supply is disabled, these 
150 ohm resistors get almost the full 20 volt power supply. So, A, maybe it's not supposed to be 20 volts. Maybe it's supposed to be 12 volts. I don't know. I'll figure it out. But as I said, I'll figure out. I'll figure that out later. But B, uh, just by enabling it, the current drops. The uh, these these circuits drive at even at 50 percent, um, and the current drops by a third. So, haven't quite figured out that mystery yet. But the, that's pretty interesting. So I powered it up. I got the neutral and the AC line connected up correctly. I verified that the chip and the, and the drivers are working. And I thought, you know what? Next is just hook up the uh, hook up the high voltage and the uh, low voltage at the same time. So I did. I hooked up the high voltage and the low voltage. And there's two wires here that output the H bridge to the transformer. And you can see there's no transformer hooked up. And they're called primary winding, primary FN winding, and primary tap. So I put my multimeter on the two main outputs and sure enough it outputs 190 volts AC I assume at 20 kilohertz uh, so looks like the H bridge is doing its job with no with absolutely no load so that's kinda handy it looks like this board is working at least so far so this brown connector there's a board that plugs in this this board plugs right in there and it's sort of snaked in between all the high current uh, stuff. There literally is a half an inch of space between the capacitors and the heatsink for the high current. And this is what lives in there. And uh, what this board does, I think, I think it's the over voltage uh, protect for the three auxiliary channels. There's uh, four, trim, four trim pots. I'm pretty sure that the, you can get an option for four auxiliaries on this uh, power supply, but this one only has the three. But this board probably is set up for four. And uh, what it has is these are TL431s, so they are a reference, uh, voltage reference with an op amp. You know, the typical uh, power supply voltage reference. These are a couple of 2N2222 20, transistors. I don't know what they do. And these are uh, two, two channel opto isolators. So I think what happens is this circuit. His job is probably to monitor each power supply, detect when it goes over voltage based on this uh, potentiometer setting, and notify the main controller through this opto, um, opto isolator. If you have any better ideas, I'd love to hear it in the comments. But yeah, that's, that's what this looks like. Because this, this, this connects to the uh, auxiliary board, and this plugs into the main board. But anyway, I removed it, figuring I don't really need that functionality for now not using the auxiliary at all so and what else is on this board what else do I need to troubleshoot to get this thing working I don't think anything I think it's pretty much working so now is the time to plug in the uh, transformer and the main output assembly which is this so instead of installing this on top of the main board which makes it so that I won't be able to access anything here, let's see if I can see if I can set this up in a sensible way. So, so here's the here's the main transformer. Here's the primary windings. I think those can go directly into the board. And then these are the secondary windings for the auxiliary board. So I'll just tape those off. And I should 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 be able to get this unit working. So I'm thinking. I'll install. I'm thinking I will install. Uh, install it kind of this way. And if I need to get the, um, and if I, if I get brave enough to, to power up the auxiliary board, uh, this will have to cable to that. If I power it up this way, uh, it will give me access to all the, uh, all the electronics without having everything jammed into one one small package. So I think that's next. I did some more reverse engineering on the main board. This is the output from the main board from the H bridge driving the primary of the of the transformer. I wired that up. Turns out there's three wires there. Two of the wires are the main winding and the 
the third wire, the white wire, is just a few uh, a few turns away from the main winding, so it provides some kind of auxiliary winding, but I have no idea what it does. And it turns out on this main board, it doesn't go anywhere. So what I found is that uh, there's a fair number of the windings on this transformer that aren't used. So I suspect that uh, they provide multiple, you know, this transformer and this whole assembly is a fairly difficult to build uh, uh, and difficult to customize. So they designed the transformer with a ton of windings on it so they could do all kinds of different power supply options with it. Anyway, the, it's nice because that means the primary winding is only two wires and that was pretty easy to easy to connect up. So I was able to reverse engineer the whole transformer and I measured the, the way you do it typically on a transformer is you measure with a continuity beeper just to find out which windings are connected together and which ones are separate and then once you know that then I use my LCR meter to measure the inductance of each primary and what you see if you want to know if something's center tapped for example like this red orange red is center tapped and then there's another gray winding which is an auxiliary which by the way is not used on this power supply but the red orange red between the red and the orange you get 215 microhenries between the orange and the red you get 215 microhenries and then because uh, inductance is uh, the turns ratio squared if you measure between red and red you'll get four times 215 or about 800 and something uh, microhenries so anyway that's one of the secondaries let's go back to the primary here the primary uh, between the red and the uh, white wire I was getting uh, 740 microhenries and between the red and the black wire I was getting 630 microhenries in a very small you know only a, uh, a handful of microhenries between the black and the and the white wire so I'm not sure what they use the white wire for so I use the red and the black and the white wire on this as I say on this motherboard doesn't connect to anything but yeah, look at look at this transformer. It's got a crazy number of uh, number of windings on it. So that's one auxiliary winding. The next auxiliary winding is the is this guy. And now this one has two sets of voltages. It has uh, the brown is the center tap, and the two white wires provide one set of secondaries, and the and the yellow wires provide a second set of secondaries. Uh, the third output is uh, the two white wires are center tapped by the brown wire and you can see that's 71 microhenries. I can figure out the turns ratio of these if I wanted to and I might do that at some point. And then there's these two auxiliary windings, two black wires, that, that's, uh, those are small wires that powers, that provides the uh, power supply for the, for the system once, it, once the system starts up. It turns out it runs off the transformer but then for some reason, it runs off the switching supply after the transformer, uh, after the system uh, powers up. The two big black wires are uh, a very low voltage winding, and that's to turn on the triac on the soft star circuit. So those are those are heavy duty wires. They're thick. Black wires are double insulated because that winding is hooked to the AC power line. And then, of course, who can forget? the main winding which is 5 volts at 120 amps. I'll talk about that later. But yeah, that's the that goes off the other side of the transformer. So all these windings you can see all these wires come off the top. This primary is there, the big black wire you can't see it from the back. And then this this monster is the 120 amp winding. And that feeds the that feeds the diode bridge and the output filter capacitors. So before I hooked up the uh, the main transformer and powered it up, I realized I needed a couple of uh, important signals. So I found the local sense wires, and those are right here, this green and green and orange wire, and they're labeled on the board LS plus and LS minus. So those are intended for local sense, and they were originally hooked to the high current uh, output assembly. 
Uh, so those are the local sense wires, and those are, you can see those are running directly to where they used to. They go to a, uh, can you see that? A little, there's a little ferrite wired in those. So those are wired directly to the output. And I did hook up the output board as well. Turns out the output board provides capacitors for the ground path for the output section. So that gives um, um, a little bit of EMI rejection, but it probably also keeps noise out of, the, uh, out of this section here. And there's also some uh, normal mode capacitors across the output. So I, so I put that back on. And here's the primary of the transformer wired up. And here's all the secondary wires, uh, dangerously floating free, uh, hopefully not shorting to each other. Um, I taped off a couple of the signals, but most of them I left. Well, the other thing I figured out is that the uh, originally I was feeding the trans the AC transformer into here, uh, but it turns out this is for this uh, this is for the boost power supply. So that's supposed to come that there's a winding on the transformer that that feeds that. So where does the AC transformer feed in? And that's on these. There was a four pin connector here. And that four pin connector goes to the fan assembly. I'll show you where that is. So this is the front panel. And the AC transformer, interestingly, mounts right here. Let's see, I think it mounts like this. Anyway, it mounts on the on, on the back of the fan, just as a they just needed a place to put it. And that's the AC transformer, and these two white wires were going to a connector, which then went to the to the uh, into the board. So instead of feeding power in here, I'm feeding it in here, and they're they're just diode or together, so it doesn't matter which one you feed it in; they both work. Although this is set up for high frequency, and this is set up for low frequency. And the other um, the other two pins on this connector, these guys were for the fan. So the, there was a four pin connector there that drives the fan and yeah and so there's a you can see the diodes let's see zoom in a little. you can see some uh, some uh, high high frequency diodes here and then there's a bridge rectifier here for the low frequency and this inductor is actually in series with the high frequency and then it feeds this capacitor and then the output of that feeds some diodes which feed the uh, all the circuitry on the board Still haven't figured out whether this thing runs off 12 or 24 volts. Um, if I, I guess I could get the uh, the boost circuit working and this, but since the boost circuit is sort of a <laughs> that's a low priority, so I haven't gotten that working yet. The other thing I needed to hook up is this pair of this white twisted pair of wires. Notice it's going into a near a bridge rectifier. That's the uh, current sense for the output section. Yeah, here's the toroidal transformer, this, ye this yellow thing here. That's in series with the, uh, that's in series with one, of, uh, one or two of the, uh, the windings of the, of the transformer. So there's a current transformer there, and I extended those wires, and I got clever. I added a connector. I realized that soldering these wires was going to give me the same headaches that I had with the original product so I put a connector in there and that's the current sense and there's another current sense here this is in the primary side of the transformer you can see there's the primary winding going straight out it comes right onto this train this uh, current sensor so yeah I hooked those two up figuring those may be important the other thing that might be important is a thermistor uh, there's uh, two of the wires uh, on this board go to a thermistor, which is on the output uh, heatsink assembly. So, if you think about it, a power supply, you know, generating 120 amps at 5 volts is fairly straightforward. What makes it complicated is all the fault conditions that can occur. You can get an overcurrent on the output. You can get an overvoltage if something, if a diode or a, or a something fails or if the loop opens up you get over voltage condition on the output but in addition you can get a lot of fault conditions on the aux on the three auxiliary supplies as well and that's what I'm pretty sure that's what this connector is for it's to, it's to transmit the uh, fault conditions of over voltage 
on those supplies and, and to shut, shut the unit down. Once I hooked up all this, I'll show you where I am now. Um, and there's my there's my output load by the way. That's a uh, that's a one ohm uh, 50 watt resistor. So that can uh, that can probably easily dissipate uh, 25 watts. So five volts at five volts at one ohm is five amps, 25 watts. And considering this is a 120 amp power supply, I figure that's it'll <laughs> that should be fairly painless. And second. The power supply does require a minimum load. So anyway, the first thing I did was I disconnected the load. The load is here. And I turn on the meter. And power up the auxiliary power supply. Which is, by the way, I turned it down. It's down to 12 volts now. Uh, let's see, what am I running it at? Yeah, 13 volts minus the diode drops of the rectifier, so about 12 volts total. And you can see it's only drawing 80 milliamps now instead of the 100 milliamps it was. And then I stood back and plugged in the AC and turned on the main AC switch. And by some miracle it put out 5 volts. See, it's running at 5.3 now. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that the system shut down. You can see it's drawing 0.19 amps now. Oops, move some of those wires out of the way. It's drawing 0.19 amps, which means the system is shut down. That's what it draws. It, you know, it, it draws it, it draws higher current once the system shuts down. Of course those monster output capacitors are still charged and they're sitting at uh, you know it's still sitting at 5.3 volts and even even if I shut the unit off between the input capacitors which are huge and the output capacitors this thing just keeps working doesn't care but uh, but but sure enough there's uh, almost no power going through the uh, through the H bridge now and you can see it's just slowly decaying and I thought okay well maybe it needs a minimum load so I put a minimum load on it, and it's this guy right here. You see it causes the output to drop fairly quickly. It's still drawing too much current, and I'll power off, even though the system is off. So let's shut off this. So it's, it's still in the fault condition. There you go. Now it's no longer in the fault condition, and we're getting very little output voltage. It's dropping down. So if I power it up, what happens is the output goes up to four and a half volts, it goes into fault, and then the output drops. So uh, it's not happy about something. So something is causing it to uh, p try to power up uh, when there's a load. Uh, like I said, it seems to work better when there's no load at all. When you put a load on it, any load, it immediately goes into a fault condition. So. Maybe I'll try a one amp load instead of a five amp load and see if see if I can tr troubleshoot it and maybe get it working a little bit better that way. So yeah, that's that's where we are now. It's kind of working. Well, the other thing I noticed on this main board is that the input ground, the you know the power, the AC ground here, and a whole bunch of other um, uh, uh, nodes around the board are grounded to the chassis. So without the chassis installed, all those connections are missing. So anyway, I, that's why I, I've been running it with the chassis. I think what I'm going to do next is it's it's kind of, uh, you know, it's only connected by these three wires and they're, you know, I don't want to damage them. So what I really need to do is build a, build a metal or wooden or something base plate to hold these heavy components in place while I while I work on it. So yeah, that's uh, that's where we are now. So the power supply was immediately going into fault mode when I powered it up, and there were two fault modes when I put a uh, 
when I put a load on it, a 5 amp load, uh, it would actually latch up in, into fault mode and it wouldn't recover until you po powered off everything. You had to power off the main AC and the low voltage supply. And, uh, and with the main AC you had to leave it off for until the capacitors discharged. And then finally the thing would come back and it would, uh, and it would do it again. Here's the soft start and the shutdown logic. So the shutdown logic, you apply a, a, a positive voltage to the uh, pin 10 and it uh, turns this transistor on inside the chip, pulls this down and uh, low uh, disables the chip. Also that uh, pin, pin 8 is the soft start and typically you put a capacitor on that so when, it, so when you do turn it on the um, current source here charges up the external capacitor and it slows uh, slowly uh, starts up the unit so so you can use either uh, shutdown or soft start as the uh, disable uh, so I probe these signals and I found out that yeah sure enough pin 10 was going high and it was staying high after the uh, after you tried powering up with load so the system was shutting down so why is that why is that happening? So I started probing around. So there's the chip. And that chip goes to a resistor here. It eventually goes down to this transistor here. And that transistor is driven by this circuit over here. So it's driven by this resistor, which is driven by this uh, transistor. I use the uh, I use the flashlight trick to uh, troubleshoot this. And what I did, let me shut it down here. Show you the show you the flashlight trick. I put this over the edge of the table, and I used a nice bright flashlight. Here's the circuitry. The nice thing about using a flashlight is now you can see all the traces. So this is a single-sided board. So all the traces are on the back and all the components are on the front. So by using the flashlight trick I could pretty quickly trace the circuit. So I thought uh, that this must be the overvoltage circuit. And this is probably this this is the main voltage adjustment. Here's the remote sense and here's the uh, this potentiometer is uh, is uh, is sealed, so it's factory adjusted. And there's a zener diode in there. So this is probably uh, the overvoltage. The overvoltage works by looking at the remote sense or uh, the local sense signals, and if they exceed, you know, it's a five volt supply. So if it exceeds six six something volts, it probably shuts down. So the transistor, the first transistor was a PNP transistor. Here, I'll show you the circuit. So here's the IC. Uh, pin 10 is the shutdown pin and it's fed by a resistor which is fed by a diode and it turns out that's fed by a PNP transistor which is capable of pulling it high and it turns out there's a couple of um, the thermal shutdown goes into there and there's also another shutdown. It's probably, I think that comes from the, uh, from the auxiliary board and that goes into there. That's the red wire. And this was two black wires. Uh, but that was all, actually, that's all disconnected. So that wasn't, that wasn't doing anything. So the transistor is normally biased off by this 320. But then I found the, that there was a, uh, uh, this R25 is the one that goes to that other mystery transistor. So the mystery transistor is labeled SIY88F. And so I googled SIY88F and looked it up on DigiKey and did all, you know, all the usual ways to find out what the heck an SIY88F is. And I could not find it anywhere. And so I measured the voltages on it and it turns out all the voltages were 0 volts. Well, I'm sorry, this, this voltage was 10 volts and the other voltages, the other pins were zero volts. I'm like, what is this? Is, is it some kind of weird FET? Is it, uh, I don't know. What the heck is this thing? And anyway, I finally figured it out. 
it's an SCR <laughs> and it's and the reason they use an SCR here it's a little tiny SCR and a TO 92 package uh, and the reason they use an SCR here is so once uh, a, a fault condition shuts this off this is a typical crowbar now in a, in a some power supplies the crowbar actually shorts the output to ground but on a 120 amp power supply you don't want to do that uh, so this is uh, when when a fault condition over voltage condition occurs it drives this uh, it drives the uh, control pin of the SCR I forgot what it's called it's an anode cathode and I think it's a gate anyway drives that high turns this on this goes low and that turns on the uh, and that um, causes a shutdown so why is it getting over voltage uh, so anyway so was, uh, one of the things I tried was I tried disabling this um, uh, crowbar circuit by lifting one of the pins of R25 and so then it wouldn't you know wouldn't power down and I figured maybe I have a better chance of seeing what was going on uh, well, it turns out I didn't really need to do that. All I needed to do was monitor the output with a scope. And here's the 5 volt output going high. So what's going on here? This is when it first turns on. Notice you get uh, some pulses. But then it gets to about 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It gets to about 5 volts and the thing goes crazy. <laughs> And what is it? What's that craziness there? And the craziness is the switching frequency. It's like, why would it be putting out switching frequency? This is a this unit has two forty-seven thousand microfarad output capacitors. Um, you can't get frequencies like that across a forty-seven thousand microfarad output capacitor. It would take infinite current. And the answer is, you probably guessed this. The both output capacitors are are dead, dead, dead. <laughs> and that was the source of the, the original source of the problem. So here's the capacitor. I took one of them out. And uh, so this is this is operating with just one, but it operates exactly the same with uh, one as it did with two. And sure enough, that's the that's the problem. So these are let's see, these are Mallory, Aerovox Mallory capacitors. They looked great. They were clean. There's no bulging. I thought, oh, these must be fine. These capacitors must be good. And uh, sure enough, they're both dead. On the LCR meter, you have to go, you have to measure at a low frequency because there's such a high capacitance. But on my LCR meter, I got uh, under one microfarad. <laughs> Each one, that's like really under one microfarad. Well, the good news is that uh, I'm kind of a scrounge. Oops. I'm kind of a scrounge. Okay, I am a scrounge. And so I never throw stuff away. So I had this um, 12,000 microfarad 25 volt cap in my junk bin. And this 18,000 microfarad also uh, 25 volt cap in my junk bin these are saved for some you know 25 volts and nice if you're building a, a linear power supply that's a great that's a great voltage for those in fact that's probably where they came from so I'm gonna now try uh, installing uh, these two cap oh, I, I measured these with the LC the LCR meter and they're both fine they both read within range I didn't I didn't I'll check the uh, ESR I have not checked the ESR, but at least the capacitance is correct on these. So I'll check the ESR. I'll install at least one of them, and see. Oh, <laughs> I, one more thing. So once I realized that the capacitors were dead, I thought, well, I'll just really quickly stick this uh, thousand microfarad, thirty-five volt capacitor across the output terminals. And sure enough, the unit sprang back to life. So, instead of the 90,000 microfarads, it turns out 1,000. 1, yeah, yeah, that'll do something. So with a 5 amp load, 
it actually went up to 5 volts and settled and the unit worked. So that's how I knew that that was the problem. That was that that confirmed that these capacitors were dead before I even removed them. And once I removed them and measured them, then that confirmed it as well. So anyway, I'll try installing uh, one or both of these capacitors and see what happens. I replaced the output capacitors, the original 46,000s, with uh, uh, the two that I had in stock. One of them is uh, 12,000 and the other one's 18,000. So it's only a third of the initial capacitance. The original capacitance was about 90,000 microfarads. This is 30,000. But I figured I'd at least get it working at low currents, and I'm probably never going to test this thing at its full 100 amps. So, And also, um, uh, I looked up trying to buy uh, the right capacitors on DigiKey, and they're, they're not available. They're about you know, fifteen twenty dollars if you do buy them each, uh, and, and but they're not even available. So anyway, so there's the new caps. There's the five amp, uh, twenty five watt load. And let's see what happens now. Though. Yay! <laughs> so you can see a little bit of, little bit of ripple on the on the waveform. Probably because the capacitors are small, but. Uh, or because maybe be just because they're old, but uh, yeah, so it goes up and settles at five volts, and the meter is happy. So yeah, finally got it working. I should have checked this originally, but it turns out you had to remove the capacitors to to test them. You couldn't test them in circuit. The good news is they they screw in, but you do have to take the whole unit apart to do it. So in the process of investigating this power supply, I assumed that these four transistors on this heatsink was an H-bridge, uh, a full a full H-bridge, four NPN transistors. But if you remember, I couldn't, couldn't figure out how these transformers with only a single winding were driving four transistors. You can see there's some ferrites on that, on there as well. And there's a big old snubber in the middle with the size of that power resistor. That's a it's gotta be like a 20 watt or 15 watt power resistor. Plus the film capacitors for the snubber. So anyway, I I had been assuming all along that it was a full H bridge. I started to uh, probe the signals and discovered that no, in fact, it's a half H bridge. There's the plus and minus uh, 160 volt supplies driving the H bridge. Uh, the transformers, the basically, uh, the four transistors are wired with two transistors in parallel with two other transistors. And that drives the primary of the transformer, and it also solves the mystery of why the, uh, why the neutral in this, the center of the power supply is connected to the heatsink. And it turns out it's, it's not. The heatsink is actually wired it's indirectly connected right here. There's a big 200 watt, 200 ohm power resistor and a big film capacitor. Let's see if you can see those. Yeah, those, that white power's on, so I gotta be a little careful. The white capacitor, uh, white uh, resistor here, that's the 200 ohms, and this is the film capacitor in series. <clears throat> I was a little surprised that they're getting 800 watts through a half bridge, but I guess it can be done. They just doubled up the output transistors to um, to get the extra current. So now that it's working, I could do some do some real measurements on it. So one of the other mysteries I had about the design was what was the actual power supply for the chip and all the control circuitry. And uh, I mentioned earlier that the, uh, initially this power transformer drives these two wires here. The, that I have hooked to a lab supply. And then once the unit powers up for efficiency, they use a, uh, a boost winding. This is a winding off the transformer in another separate diode bridge to power it up. So anyway, the mystery is solved. The fan gets about uh, 20 volts DC and the IC gets about 18 volts. I was pretty close. I was driving the uh, power supply at 20 volts and that, that's what I was getting.
it still draws a fair amount of power on these resistors when the unit is disabled. But at least it's working. So the question is, what's next? I feel like getting the uh, getting the unit working was a moral victory. I'll probably test it at higher currents. I have a I have a couple of uh, electronic loads that I can get up to uh, 20 or more amps. So that that might be a nice uh, a nice test to do. I don't want to drive it too hard because the with the uh, capacitors of unknown quality on the output. But yeah, this is that's kind of exciting to get this thing working. The, I guess the next question is should I try to get the uh, auxiliary power supplies working? So this board is completely disconnected. And here's where the here's where it connects to the transformer windings. And I did some work on that, so it might, might be fun to get this working. But if I'm going to do any more work on this, I need to mount this heavy assembly to the same structure as this. I can't. I'm putting stress on these wires, and I already broke one one pad off of a PC board just from soldering and unsoldering. So I got to be a little bit more careful. And then the question is, well, how do I mount this? This pole mounts on this this little insulated mount here so I mean we could do it so we'll see what happens thanks so I draw a new schematic for the for the power supply uh, the old one had a couple of errors in it and it was getting a little a little bit messy so this is the main, uh, the main signal path from from the input to the output. We've talked about all these circuits, but let's look at the big picture just for a minute. So, line and neutral come in, 20 amp fuse on the board. Input uh, input filter, common mode choke and uh, and capacitors. Uh, this is the inrush current limiting circuit consisting of the track and the uh, and the dropping resistor. Of course, this is driven by one of the transformer windings. Before the electronics comes up, the resistor limits the uh, the inrush current to the to the uh, capacitor bank through the diode bridge, and then after the electronics comes up, the uh, triac turns on and uh, shorts out the resistor and gives it the full power. Uh, big diode bridge, 120, 240 jumpers, the six output uh, bulk capacitors. Those, by the way, generate plus and minus 160 volts. Originally I thought this was a full H-bridge because there were four transistors, but then I discovered it was a half H-bridge and that each uh, transistor actually has a another transistor in parallel to increase the current. These are the uh, base drive windings coming off the toroidal transformers. The output of the H-bridge feeds the primary of the transformer. Uh, there's a big snubber on the H bridge on the on the uh, on that board. I keep calling it H bridge on the half H bridge board. And the return for the uh, primary goes through the uh, a big film capacitor uh, with, in parallel with a 200 ohm power resistor, and that returns to the common. And the common, of course, is this common over here, which, if you trace it back, is connected to the neutral of the, uh, of the AC. And then there's the high current output stage. The transformer winding is made of a, of a I can't, I don't know whether to call them tape wound or bus bar wound uh, transformer. Uh, the center tap of the transformer goes through a big inductor. That's the one that's underneath the transformer. So the so the overall loop. This is a uh, well, basically this is a forward converter, and the overall loop consists of a push-pull transformer driving uh, rectifiers in each diode. And the rectifier actually consists of two 60-amp Schottky diodes in parallel. And then that charges the output capacitors. And this is where the problem was. The output capacitors were shot. The same configuration, this inductor could be shown here. And it would have the same exact effect. 
as if it's here. But it's in the minus path of the capacitors instead of the instead of the plus path. Uh, there's a current sense transformer consisting of uh, these two leads from these two diodes go through the through the uh, center of the toroid, and then the outer side of the toroid goes to the white wires, which go to the main board. On the output side, uh, the output uh, bus bars are connected directly to these two large capacitors, and there's two things that come off of there. There's the uh, local sense which senses the uh, 5 volts right at the output and then there's the minimum load circuit and the minimum load circuit is also hooked to the plus 5 and, and return. The minimum load is adjustable so as the load on the power supply increases the minimum load decreases so it doesn't waste extra power. And I drew all the extra windings for the transformer on here as well. So What's interesting about this power supply? A couple of things. One is, after, after I figured all this out, it's basically the same as uh, most PC power supplies. The regulator circuit uh, is similar. It's a push-pull driving uh, transformer coupled uh, bases for the uh, half H-bridge. And then the H-bridge is AC coupled to the common of the, of the uh, high voltage power supply. There's a few differences between this and a PC power supply. First of all, a PC power supply is typically two or 300 watts. And at two or 300 watts, an inrush current limiter is not needed. But I've looked at some five and 600 watt PC power supplies, and they do have an inrush current limiter. Some use a triac, but some use a relay. This, a relay could be serve this purpose as well. Obviously, uh, a PC wouldn't have uh, double transistors here because of the power level. It wouldn't be necessary. I don't think I've ever seen a PC power supply with uh, two sets of output transistors. And the other big difference on a PC power supply is that this inductor has multiple windings and those windings are in series with the other uh, secondaries of the transformer. The, the auxiliary windings on a PC, the 12 volts and the uh, and the minus 12 volts uh, are not uh, isolated from the main. They're, they probably share a common lead on the transformer. In addition, they share a common, a common output inductor. And uh, I've never seen a PC with 46,000 microfarad output caps either. They're usually operating at a higher frequency. This one operates at uh, 26 kilohertz. And PCs usually operate a little bit higher than that. But I think the early PCs are about the same. And it kind of makes sense because this was designed in the probably the mid, early to mid 80s, and so were the original PC power supplies. They were all designed in the early to mid 80s as well. And uh, they're very similar to, to what we see. Let's see, other differences between a, between a PC. Oh, yeah, PCs. This, this uses a, a Silicon General SG. 3525 slash 27 for a controller chip and most PCs don't use that chip they use the the TI TL 494 chip but uh, you know if you stand back and uh, squint a little bit this doesn't look too much different than a than a PC power supply it has some additional features and obviously a much higher output current so I decided to operate this at a higher current and uh, my electronic load, my homemade electronic load here, goes up to 20 amps plus the uh, 5 amps that this resistor is using. So 25 amps total on the load. And the, as I turned up the load, I was smelling something. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, the, I still had the soft start circuit uh, on the... Uh, track wasn't being enabled so all the AC current all 200 watts of AC power through this resistor here which didn't like that at all and so the resistor is getting very hot so I wired up this um, soft start winding from the transformer I added some wire to it so I could connect that up and that solved the, the overheating problem and the, now the soft start circuit works works as it was originally intended
but the first time I powered it up after that the two amp fuses that I had in this in this uh, AC power inlet box blew uh, it's kind of spectacularly um, they they both the, there's one in the line one in the neutral and they both blew and I didn't have any higher current 20 millimeter fuses so I went to the hardware store and bought a couple and and they the only ones they had were up to 6.3 amps so that's what's in there now but it seems to work but uh, because the fuses were four dollars each I didn't want to blow any more fuses than I ha absolutely had to so I hooked up my Variac so that I could soft start this thing myself and once I was comfortable that it wasn't drawing too much power and that the soft start circuit was working correctly I now can run the run the Variac at full power and as soon as I enabled the uh, triac for the uh, inrush current circuit I notice there's a buzzing sound I don't know if you can hear it uh, but anyway there's a 60 Hertz buzzing sound coming out of the coming out of the power supply somewhere of course it has to be somewhere in this AC section here and I finally traced it to I use the uh, I use the screwdriver uh, against my ear method if you don't know that method you hold an insulated screwdriver against the thing you suspect making the noise and you hold your ear up against the other end and uh, there it was and sure enough it was the common mode transformer if you think about it the common mode transformer was operating through a nice safe 12 ohm resistor before and it was nice and quiet but now the current waveform going into this transformer is uh, pretty heavy duty uh, pulses to charge the uh, charge the rec charge the uh, large capacitor bank up through this bridge rectifier, and those high current pulses are what's causing it to buzz. I suspect it's always done it, but since the original power supply was inside a box and then inside another box, and there was a, a fairly noisy fan in the power supply and three noisy fans in the in the uh, in the box itself probably nobody ever heard this buzzing but it doesn't seem to be hurting anything and uh, everything seems to be working fine the noise and ripple is about a hundred millivolts and it probably would be better if I had the, the right output capacitors on the supply but we'll take that for now So, you know, I'm running this without a fan, so I'm a little nervous about things getting hot. So I used my little temperature meter, and the only thing I found that was hot was these, let's see, getting up to 75, 80 degrees on these, uh, on those big power resistors in the base drive circuit. And everything else, the output circuit, 25 amps, the triac board, the main the main diodes now the diodes getting a little warm 36 36 degrees uh, but you know everything else is running pretty much ice cold transformer gets a uh, goes up a little tiny bit I don't think I would try to run this thing at 100 amps with its current configuration set up the way it is but you know 25 amps is pretty respectable and that's what that's all my current uh, load goes up to. I could cobble together something with uh, extra resistors or extra loads, but I think I'm pretty happy with the, uh, the performance I'm getting out of it right now. So one of the things I'm thinking of doing with this is to use this as an H bridge, uh, sorry, half H bridge uh, circuit to drive either this transformer and use some of the other windings on it for experimentation. Or, uh, you know, I'm trying to get into some higher power transformer design and coming up with, an, coming up with a, a drive architecture is a fair amount of work. So I could use this to test other transformers at probably, you know, not, not the 850 watts that this power supply puts out, but at lower powers. With all the junk I've collected over the years, I don't have room for a giant breadboard like this so not 
sure what I'm going to do with this. It's kind of a little bit large for something that I might use someday. Another possibility is to just use a PC power supply to do this job. Now that I've torn this thing down and I'm familiar enough with all the pieces of it, uh, clearly I could use a PC power supply, which is much smaller, to do uh, to do the same job for most of the work that I'm doing. I'm typically operating in the 100 to 200 watt range, not nowhere near this. Although I do kind of like the convenience of this, that the power circuitry can be uh, run from a, either from a transformer or from a lab supply. Uh, the problem with a lot of PC power supplies is that you need a you need a bootstrap circuit since the since you know it's it's a startup problem. The controller chip in a PC is operated on the grounded side, and it needs power in order to start up to then drive power. So uh, so typically they have an extra either an extra transformer or some tricks to get the circuit started. Uh, whereas this this doesn't require any tr any any tricks uh, or any fancy uh, extra windings on the transformer or anything, it'll just start up and run all by itself if you just give it give it uh, DC power. And I could probably do that on a on a PC power supply as well. So if you got some ideas of what I could do with this, let me know in the comments. So oh yeah, one more one more thing. I did, I've got to be careful here, this thing's on, <laughs> I did power up the uh, auxiliary board. All I did was uh, apply 24 volts DC to one of these transformer, where one of these transformer windings goes to one of these 12 volt supplies. And I was able to get both of the uh, 12 volt supplies working. I couldn't get the 24 volt supply working. Uh, so, you know, I'll hang on to this board if I need a high current buck. Uh, regulator or multiple high current buck regulators. Uh, this is a might be a handy way to handy way to provide that. So yeah, I'm pretty satisfied that I got most of this uh, most of the system working at least independent pieces. It's been a kind of a interesting and fun project. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. I know it's a little long. If you enjoyed it. Please click uh, like and uh, subscribe if you want to see some, some more videos like this. Thanks.